everybody. Welcome to Movie Night. Uh, this <laughs> week we're talking about Beneath the Planet of the Apes from 1970, as picked by me for no other reason than, you know, we've been trying to expand our horizons as horror fans and finding horror adjacent things like sword and sorcery movies. And I love the Planet of the Apes movies. And I think that this particular Planet of the Apes sequel probably has the most horror elements tied into it with like the entire third act basically <laughs> sure yeah but uh i you know i wanted to discuss it because i think in a lot of ways people look at this as one of the lesser sequels in the planet of the apes franchise and for me it's my favorite film out of the five what um, would be what would be considered um what's the general consensus on like the best sequel i don't i'm i'm so this is such a blind this spot is my of first planet of the apes me. movie by the way okay is that right so let I me watch any of them so let me explain yeah. not even tim burton's yeah. i didn't Christ. even know it was his until what was it two months ago when matt told us that's that? true oh. um all right so i would say that probably on the higher end of the sequels that people like is the one that immediately follows this one and i will do a very quick breakdown of why i think is this return, franchise return uh escape Escape. Escape from the so, planet. Thank you. So here's where I think the Planet of the Apes right. movies are brilliant because we all know the first Planet of the Apes movie. Like, we know, even if you've never seen it, you know the basic idea. Yes. Astronaut comes to this planet. Uh, humans don't talk on it. Apes control it. Uh, he finds out that it was Earth all along and he's in the future. And it's a fucking bummer. This sequel shows up and it's these astronauts who are looking for the astronaut who never came home um, end up in the same basic time loop end up here on this planet at the end of this movie spoiler alert the entire earth is destroyed even yes. more of a bummer yeah <laughs> so in escape Brutal. from the planet of the apes that movie Doesn't takes place in 1970 and you find out that two of the apes the two scientist apes escaped before the explosion and went through the the same time loop back to present day United States. And that movie's literally just about them dealing with like the inherent racism of them being different than everybody. Apes in the city, huh? Um Sam. and if, and throughout that movie they find out like where where these creatures come from and what that means for Earth's destruction. So the government's like, we have to kill these fucking apes. And they're pregnant with a baby. They successfully oh, kill the apes, but they get their baby safely into a circus, like a traveling circus. The fourth movie takes place in the distant future of 1992. Um, oh my! And it, that's the uh, oh shit! Yeah, yeah, that's close. And that um, that baby ape has uh, grown up and knows who his parents were. Know everything. Knows everything, but also knows to keep quiet because since they showed up on Earth, Earth has been like, we need to keep these apes subverted. So they force apes into manual labor, and he causes the uprising. And then the fifth movie is literally the war where the apes take over the humans and the whole movie kind of starts anew with the first. Like, it's kind of that the five movies work in a perfect circle that constantly loops into itself, which I think is pretty impressive for like 1975 or whatever, when they were just kind of shitting these movies out on like one Battle year. was 73. I'm, I'm 73. on the Wikipedia. Thank you. Yeah, so they were basically they popping were out. They were shitting these out one a year? One a year. So Planet of the Apes was 68, and then Beneath was 70, Escape was 71, Conquest was 72, and Battle was 73. Yeah. And no. then there was a TV series yep. <laughs> that started in 74. Yeah. How? People were going ape for the Planet of the Apes, oh, my dudes. Oh, my. Come on, <laughs> That joke <Matthew>. is bananas. <laughs> B-A-N-A-N-A-S. Um, I I mean, I do want to brief. Well, first of all, let me ask you guys. what did So this was like a first experience for both of you. What did you guys think of it ultimately? Because even in the rewatch, I was like, man, I forgot how disturbingly timely some of the political points being brought up in this 70s film still hold true. In 2023, didn't feel, didn't feel good, man. <laughs> no, that was no. a fucking bummer. And, yeah, and, and and um, the the real takeaway for me is I fucking hate Charlton Heston. Yeah, um, he was only <laughs> yeah, on dude. screen for a total of like four minutes, I'd say, and he gives such SA vibes. Yeah, like mm -hmm. I. Ugh! Yeah. This doesn't Gross. shock anybody, but he only agreed to come back to this movie if they killed him because he had no desire to do any more of them. 
Um, and part of me feels like <laughs> because fine. he probably understood that this goes against all of his own personal politics. <laughs> It was just yeah. like, I don't want to be tied to this yeah. movie. Let's talk about Brandon, though. Absolute <laughs> stunner. Yeah. Holy shit, what a gorgeous man. <laughs> I yeah, agree. <laughs> you know, I also got to say that he, um, the thing I liked best about watching him is that he's not like, yeah, he's like wearing a loincloth the whole time, right? Yeah. Uh, but he's not like a Conan type. You know, no. he's just a normal looking dude. dude. He's a scientist. He's an astronaut, you know, yeah. like. I liked that casting. Um, I also thought that the woman who played what's her face um, Nova 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 who Nova. she plays Nova in like what three of these movies or something like that absolutely gorgeous. I was shocked that she wasn't a Bond girl because yeah. she gave me serious Bond girl vibes. Yeah. And I I did read the Wikipedia about the first two movies, and I was like, oh, it makes sense that they picked that actor because. Well, they picked that actor because they went with whoever would be okay with wearing the least amount of clothing for the most amount of time, yeah. um, which is awful. Uh, I, I hate that. But apparently their original casting for the 68 movie, Planet of the Apes, was a Bond girl. Um, yeah. And I guess that it just – she didn't test well. And then they got uh, Linda Harrison. Okay. Um, she was like – apparently very camera shy for the first now i feel like it's okay if we talk about the series because i have a good feeling that there isn't a whole lot of blood to squeeze from this stone no Um, i mean i don't expect us to do the other four the most the the highest chance of us ever ever doing another one of these again would be if there was some giant Planet of the Apes remake coming out that we're like, all right, maybe we should do Conquest to Which just like tie I into s- SEO, but dude, that's the I only way forgot. I could think of it. <laughs> I forgot that there was all those new ones. The new uh, ones are actually impressively well made. Like the yeah. the Wait, so Dawn, how many of the, you... Rise, Dawn, and War of the Planet of the Apes are like oh competently made movies. Yeah. Jesus. Why yeah. are there so many movies? I honestly don't understand the attraction. Of any of this. I mean, like, how are there five of these, first of all? Um, because no one can emote in the the, the ape makeup. Like, yeah. they literally have baby coconuts over their lips. And they just bob, 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 bob. Well, my, so I like do want to talk about the makeup. Because at the time, the makeup was very impressive. Like, the prosthetics and everything was very impressive. It, I believe, was kind of the big selling point was like, oh, wow, look at how they made these people look like apes. What I think is really funny, though, is that it costs a lot of money to do that. So when you see the giant crowd scenes, like in the very beginning where there's like the debate between the general yeah. and Dr. Zayas, anyone who's not a speaking ape, you can tell that they're just wearing like a store-bought gorilla mask or whatever yeah, that yeah. like does not I emote the, whatsoever. I think the more impressive group scene is with the telepathic humans when they all take off their faces oh my because God. they're doing oh they're God, they're yeah. singing in their like little chapel in underground and there are at least like 30 people with that that makeup on yeah. and i was like now that is expensive now we'll get we'll <laughs> get know? into the the whole telepathics in a second because the only other thing that i wanted to write that i wanted to draw attention to that i think is a really good scene and i think it's also seen that as we said before, whether you find it frustrating or weirdly comforting that nothing has changed in 40 years or, or 50 years or whatever it is, um, the protester scene. When they come yeah. up to the protesters who are trying to protest against the war and the general wants to have them killed on the spot for protesting and it's the scientist who's like, let's not draw more attention to what we're doing right now, you idiot. Mm-hmm. Like, like, just mm-hmm. keep on moving. And it... I think that that also is a part of what the appeal was, was that this movie on its on the surface is a very dumb movie. It's a movie about a planet filled with apes. I think the skillful thing is that, you know, you're doing a movie that was the first script for the first movie was written by Rod Sterling. Like, you're getting a lot oh, of that. Oh, I missed that. Yeah, like, you're that. getting a lot of that, like, very on-point satirical comments and political like allegory and and all of that is like crammed into this yeah and then the part that makes or breaks people when it comes to beneath the planet of the apes 
is this telepathic cult worshiping the last bomb. And I fucking love it. <laughs> it is, for me, it was, it's a slog. It was a slog when there were people in gorilla makeup yeah. on screen. When the when the telepaths were around, I was way more into it. Now that's not saying a lot. Yeah. But I I'm I did I did prefer that. I, I mm-hmm. thought that it was kind of fun that in the beginning when they show up um and meet the first telepath, the the writing is literally just kind of like an I am Groot type thing where yes. there's no speaking yeah. but then they do the the exposition by having whoever response, is being spoken yeah. to respond I really like that call I like the idea mm-hmm. that we the audience don't hear what they're saying to the people like it would, I was, have, been, it would have been too lame yeah. if it was like the Star Trek-y kind of like wow 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 and then yeah. you hear somebody no I like that it's almost like a voice. high pitch ear piercing sound that we and hear. they just have the they just have like the one it's not a throwaway line but it explains everything it's like the line is like oh they're it, it's so in um not intuitive but it's like um oh i forget the word now i should have written down the line but it basically was like talking just like straight one-on-one talking is so basic to them yeah like it's <laughs> like that that is so basic but that's the only way that this human understands this human is not developed enough to do any of this stuff so what do you think they would talk. think about podcasters holy shit oh, they would oh hate us <laughs> we are next so level um Ooh. oh are you thirsty kyle no parched uh, because i've been <laughs> beneath this goddamn dirty ape planet for so long i'm drinking endless depths Ooh. by abomination it is a very it nice. is a prickly pear calamansi mango and black lava sea salt sour that um, you get the coolest sours, dude. It's a it's a fantastic sour. I, I have a drink favorite. as well. What do you got? And going I think on? that my drink is the rarest thing you could find beneath the planet of the apes. Water. Ice water. <laughs> water. <laughs> I put I it in mean, a I stemless should... champagne glass I to make really it didn't especially think you were just have water. I'm so happy. <laughs> so so good. Um. But yeah, let's get into why I picked the the horror part of this movie is the telepath. I mean, it yeah. does feel like a Twilight Zone. I know it's this one's not yeah. written by Rod Serling, but it it does feel like it kind of honors that. Like, oh, we're just gonna make this a fucking weird episode of it, Twilight Zone, and it's got act. I I like that they can use their telepathy to have you see things that aren't there, and we get like the first flash of that where like it's that. That beautiful, oh, that fire. yeah, that beautiful '70s like painted on fire and painted on lightning on the celluloid mm-hmm. effects. But the scene that I have that has been burned into my brain from childhood because these used to play on like the Disney Channel or something all the time um, yeah. is when the apes are being attacked with it, and it's the statue that's bleeding and like crumbling in front of them, and I'm like, God, this yeah, is so cool like it's just so cool to me um which is something not a lot of people will ever say about anything related to the planet of the apes <laughs> but, but i think that this movie's cool uh and i think that the other thing that i as i was watching i'm like you know what i think scott's kind of enjoying this is the the way that it also kind of attacks the concept of organized religion with like these weird hymns that they've taken and changed the word God to bomb in it. And it's just like, they're literally worshiping this thing of destruction. But I was like, I love this. I love how smart this decision is to have them worshiping a nuclear weapon. Like, um, and I think back to something Kyle said a very long time ago and I've quoted, I don't think Kyle knows that I've quoted him about this, ever but probably one of the first times we ever got into a conversation about religion kyle said something that i related to so much which is you know you can either accept religion in a way that he has where it's this very comforting calming peaceful thing that he feels guides him to make good decisions or you can be an absolute terror to everybody (laughs) and like and i think this movie really analyzes that and looks at the idea of the people who, in fact, become a terror to the world at large with their their belief. And 
I, I just, I think this movie's so smart. I think it's so witty. The entire church mm. service between the songs and then the big reveal of them peeling off their faces. So did you guys have any clue that that was going to happen? Did that like blow your fucking minds when they started ripping their faces? <laughs> I, I was surprised, but not shocked because okay. I was mm. like, there's no way that they have been living underground and have telepathy that there's not some nastiness going yeah. on. I didn't know. It was well, and their costume be was so distracting. Yeah. Like their costumes yeah. were so distracting. I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't connect that their costume would have anything to do with their like bodily functions uh, or their being or their, <laughs> their being. But uh, I was annoyed. I was like, what's going on here? And then in the prison cell, once he gets, once the, um, the guard for lack of a better term gets thwacked, and we and we see the like the composition of the shot that is clearly going to peel off his head. I just thought they were going to be like Mars attacks brains. Like yeah. I, re- I really thought they were just going to have this big brain. That would have been sick on. too. That would have been done. Like I think, yeah. I, I think ultimately, like them being a being that is not quite human. Um, I would say they're more human than human. Than God human. damn it, Scott! I was waiting for him to finish to make the exact same joke. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. I <laughs> um, I, I, I even love the contradictory nature of them, where they're like, we're a peaceful being. We won't kill you. We're just going to convince you to kill each other. And it's like, that's not being a peaceful being. Yeah, they <laughs> like, kept calling their peaceful weapon, basically, their sensory warfare was peaceful weaponry. <laughs> I was like, that is the least peaceful thing, <laughs> going after somebody's like distinct senses and well-being. That is so violent. <laughs> is- I really, you know, and and... I have to agree, and I think that the biggest ick I got in this movie was the amount of times that Nova got strangled. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I was just like, oh, I really don't. I, I'm, I, I was really trying my best to keep this historical. Yeah. You know, like well, trying to understand. To it, yeah, like the, 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 the keep the lens historical. The the uh, the quote that I remember Art. hearing JB use on an episode of Camp Nightmare that I've used a few times as well is um. It's an explanation, not an excuse. Um, like when talking sure. about that stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, look, I'm looking at it because I understand that this was the 70s. That still doesn't excuse it, but it's an explanation for why it was considered fine. Yeah, um, yeah. Like yeah. if we were ever to, I spit on your grave. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. that would be the same thing. It's like we won't listen. Get it? Just, no, <laughs> no, we will not. We have just, just let some. You, just let you know, we won't. Yeah, yeah. But just, if we ever just were, in case you're. Ser- Serena specifically, like we're yeah. not, gonna, we're not gonna be I doing. Mean, we'll do fucking martyrs before we try to on your grave. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, it's like that. Last house on the left, like in a, in many a ways, still very well made movies. Ain't fucking for us. Not not for. I our mean, podcast. I have no. I, those are one and done. Actually, I would. I I'm embarrassed to say that I think that I have made it through. Um, Last house on the left, two and a half times i think last house on the left it's Those more a school. specific scene than the whole yeah. vibe like i spit on your grave it's the whole vibe <laughs> the, you the have whole to go through everything. a lot of ick to get to the dick cutoff scenes yeah you know like that's really what i'm there for exactly and then mm-hmm. let's not even talk about the fucking remake which is yeah. so much yeah. ickier yeah um speaking yes yeah, so, I mean, so, so much ickier they did three yeah they, they did th- i knew that they did two i didn't know they did three I all i know three. is that um uh oh god the gay best friend in um mean girls gets does he get his jaw ripped off or some some sort I've of fucking never egg. watched oh, any of those i've never seen the last house remake i've never seen the ice on your grave that. remakes like i, I just... actually heard the last house remake in a late 2000s way is is fine i mean of course again content aside yeah. like, <laughs> i just think that I think the late 2000 2000... i think there's a microwave kill which just sounds great <laughs> wait Love... how do you kill an entire human with a microwave not sure not sure scott but uh i'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to know <laughs> I'd like look to know scott we all got works. questions we're not yeah. going to get answers because I don't think any of the three of us are going to volunteer this this watching to find out. In microwave massacre, I don't know if they answered it. <laughs> now, okay, if we're talking about icky movies that we microwave. may eventually get to, microwave massacre is still a very year real year potential. ten. Yeah, we may. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, guys, can I also uh, just one thing? All the music cues sounded like um Instagram super super zoom. Do you remember the super zoom? <laughs> And any of these like weird TikTok sounds and like early iMovie uh, sound effects, all the music cues sounded exactly what like. What a strange 
flex. Oh, you're Dude, a strange was... man, and that's why we love you, Kyle. I didn't do this. I'm pretty sure that I'm. I mean, though, I feel right, so I guess I did this. Um. Uh, well, but they sounded really weird. Ninety One Donkey Lane is a magical apartment complex that contains immense power, but lacks intelligent inhabitants. What is happening? I'm getting texts. Why are we getting a lot of texts? People found out what we did. Oh, dividing Mike Myers into an infinite amount of tiny Mike Myers. Listen to 91 Donkey Lane for free on Spotify or your favorite podcasting app. More at 91donkeylane.com. See you there, you donkeys. Well, guys, I thank you for humoring me on, hey, let's talk about a, a Planet of the I'm Apes movie. And, and hey, but you know what? You, you, have to, you have to double feature it, though, so, because it's your pick. So what are you going to double feature with this? Um, my favorite movie where someone reveals that they have a horribly scarred face under what you thought was their actual face, House of Wax from 1954. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Kyle, what about you? Uh, I Because there was a ladder that was ringing... Uh, tonally, beneath the Planet of the Apes, I've chosen Phantasm. Okay. Uh, as the tune, the tuning oh, fork in an up, into yeah. another dimension. It felt, I don't know, it, they don't really match, but I it makes I sense to me. <laughs> yeah. Man, and, you know, I, I was mean, thinking I, about this. We've only done Phantasm two. I two. feel like yeah. we really need to at least do the first and the third one, maybe even the fourth and the fifth. Wow. Uh, four is rough. Yeah. Is that Ravager? Three, or that's that three, five. Three would be three could be fun. Yeah. Uh, no, four, uh, that's five. Five's five Ravager. Oblivion. Four's Oblivion. like land of something. I want to say. Uh, uh, Oblivion, because you got the Oblivion. IV yes. Thing, yes. Uh, the IV. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, no, we could, we could, I would be down to do one, three, and four. I would really need some convincing for five because what I remember from it is that it's really boring. Okay. Really so boring. I, I only really remember one through three. So um, I don't even remember three and I don't yeah. remember four. I know I watched them with Mario, but I, I'm, <laughs> and we know you love part two. Boy, do you uh, love part two. All right. And speaking of people two. who love Phantasm part two, Scott, you're the only one who hasn't picked a double feature. Um, I don't know which one I would go with. I would pick a Superman movie, um, w one of the uh, Christopher Reeve movies, because the the like the charger for their 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 atomic bomb just looked like something out of the Fortress of Solitude. Yes, yes, it um, did. So um, literally any of those, like the first three, I guess. Oh no, I go no. four. Let's do it's... Superman or Superman two. I do not want to have him fight Nuclear Man or whatever. Oh, I was gonna say <laughs> Quest for Peace Part Four. That's exactly yeah, what this. Is. That's the one that makes the most sense. Oh, it does make this. the. Fuck. Okay, <laughs> that would be a really grueling night. Uh, I'm just gonna be honest, but that's that's like a Pain Olympics type night. Uh, well, guys, if you've been checking us out the last couple of weeks, then you know we have a oh, new yeah. and exciting ex segment on this podcast called What's Going On? And <laughs> for this segment, we don't really have anything too crazy to promote. Um, on Black Friday, I'll be doing a one-hit Thunder live stream. Come check it out. It's us celebrating 200 episodes of the podcast. And uh, beyond that, hit up our Patreon, patreon.com backslash HMN podcast, and find us on all of our socials. We post some cool shit on there. Also, in case you missed it, we were on uh, Horrors of Love, which is a newish podcast uh, from one of Kyle's best friends. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this podcast and your best friend real quick? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, So Jeanette Wall, uh, who is the writer of Ouchie, formerly known as The Wound Within, which I've talked about on the show before, uh, mm -hmm. which a lot of you have supported, which I appreciate. Um, they have a podcast called Horrors of Love, which explores uh, horror films through the lens of love, gender, sex, um, all sorts of uh, addiction, all sorts of sort of like these... Big emotions. Ooh, we feelings that we have yeah. uh in regards to horror and uh, uh all three of us got to join them for a, an episode on one of our favorites brain damage um so we go pretty in depth uh we talk about a lot of shit uh but it's a fun episode uh horrors of love you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts and also um, if you so. are upset that we are not a long form podcast i think that that clocks in at like an hour and 15 minutes and that's that's long form yeah. dog so if you feel like you need to get us doing that for any reason uh it's a good go one. elsewhere where we guessed because we <laughs> yeah, won't do it <laughs> yeah. it won't happen here it won't happen here. ain't that the no, fucking you could truth. go onto our patreon you can go to our patreon 
when we do um, sound tracking episodes, can go those, to those are sometimes. almost <laughs> always 45 minutes to an hour. We care way more about non-horror movie soundtracks sometimes <laughs> than... Yeah. Well, it's because the tangents are just impossible to avoid. Yeah, yeah. We talk about horror a lot. We don't always talk about... Uh, El Nino. <laughs> no. But when we Ironically, do... Ironically, on a horror soundtrack. Yeah. Kyle. Yeah, wait. Yeah. Okay, hold on. What a third eye blind. Yeah. What were we talking about before? <laughs> Matt, what do you want to talk about? What have you watched? What have you consumed? Um. So right now, I'm still doing a lot of horror movie rewatches, because even though this is coming out in November, we're recording this while I'm still in the thick of spooky season, binge watching all my favorites. Um. But I did take a break. Uh, to watch a show that is like massively critically acclaimed and adored. And I had been putting it off because I didn't think I would like it. But then someone told me it's Ted Lasso in a kitchen. And I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. Uh, and that is The Bear on uh, Hulu, which um, the the Ted Lasso in the kitchen is like true and not true. Uh, so if you've ever worked in a kitchen in your entire life, boy, will you relate to most of this show um, you do have to, if you're like me and like you get very anxious watching people be anxious, you're going to have to just kind of push through the first like three episodes maybe. Um, but it's a 30 minute episode show, which is great. There's 18 episodes so far total. So it's a quick watch. Uh, and it's about a guy whose brother um, passes away. And in his will, he leaves him his like family hot dog stand type restaurant uh but this guy is like the best chef in new york and now he has to like relocate to chicago and deal with this like trash heap of a restaurant and it's basically this guy who is the best at what he does and even though he's got a lot of like depression and anxiety and self-doubt and everybody is very unsure about him. He's able to like one by one rally this kitchen to like want to be better and like want to be respected as a kitchen and not just like be there because everyone knows it because it's a family like restaurant that's been there forever. So like everyone loves it. Um, and, and just kind of watching how he empowers every single one of these characters throughout like the 18 episodes I mean, I was I was watching the final episode today. Eighteen be- episodes. Yeah, two seasons. Oh God. So oh, okay. eight episodes, season one, ten episodes, season two. Okay. Um, but like, I was watching the most recent episode, which we're gonna definitely get a third season. But I was literally tearing up and crying uh, watching the last episode. And worth noting about this show because yes, the writer's strike is over. The actor strike is still going on. This show in particular became a big rallying cry during the writer's strike. Um, by one of the writers who was literally uh, without a home while this was the number one oh show uh, trying to explain how streamers are like literally keeping writers basically unemployed. He wrote the most critically acclaimed episode of the second season and barely could afford his rent and was living in a, basically an empty apartment with no heat throughout the winter because the residuals for writing on a streaming show are so disgustingly low. Their story in regards to the strike is super, super important. Uh, I, and forgive me, because I can't remember if it was the same story of the person who had like gone to the awards show for it with like a borrowed bow tie. Yeah. And like, you know, what? it was like, yeah, they were, they Holy were, shit. I mean, they were, if I remember correctly, they were like working on getting themselves back on their feet, but like really still struggling to to do so. And then, you know, the strike happens like you have. Yeah, it's it's those those stories are especially from writers. Like, let's just be honest, like those stories from writers are so, so vital to any information that's going on with the strike, both writers strike specifically. But then they allow you to parallel and understand a lot of what's going on with SAG. Um, and it is, it's, 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 man, I've said bummer. I mean, take a drink again, uh, <laughs> listeners, cause I'm going to say fucking bummer yeah. one more time. Um, because it sucks out there. Uh, right now, uh, as we're talking, we're still yeah, he at made... the table for SAG. So like oh, fucking let's hope that <laughs> by, at, by Thanksgiving, we get some answers. And get yeah. Some, he said, I, I pulled up movement. the one article, Alex O'Keefe was the writer's name. He was the staff writer for the bear. 
Um, and he made an entire salary of $43,000 working on the show for the year. Um, and then his story was, uh, the studio refused to fly me to the writer's room in LA. So I had to do all of my work from a Brooklyn apartment. My heat was out during the pandemic winter and my space heater blew out all the lights in the apartment while I worked. Not great. Not, not a great circumstance. How can you have the show that's kind of being looked at as like single-handedly saving Hulu for the last two years and the writers can't afford (laughs) to take care of their gas and heat bill. It's a problem. And I'm glad that they won all of the things that the writers won. Let's also make sure that the actors get what they deserve and that they keep AI manipulated actors, the fuck out of movies and TV shows. So disturbing. Um, Yeah. But anyway, that was my little rant, but end result is the bears really good. (laughs) Are you the one that's been pointing that poison in my wife's ear? Telling no, us to watch it. I haven't said anything okay. to anybody okay. about it yet. She's like, so. I've been. Some people are saying that we should watch it, and I'm like, no, I don't want to watch it. I've worked in a kitchen, and it's gonna stress me the fuck out. So <laughs> the I, first, I the first three episodes will definitely stress you out, and then maybe the last two episodes uh, will, will also stress you out. But like in that, but kind I don't of want. Happy, it, I don't reason. want that. You I know. know. Like that was why Ted Lasso was so good, is because yeah. it's like. Because you're not tied. Well, also, neither one of us ever played soccer professionally, so we're not like emotionally tied to the stress of that. But I definitely worked in a retirement home kitchen, which, while not the same as working in a kitchen kitchen, it is still you have that like kitchens and kitchens, man. It's I mean, they describe it perfectly in the episode I just watched, where he's like, "All right, we're opening the door." He's like, "We're going to unlock the door. We got 15 minutes before it's a full house. We got 30 minutes until we're in the shit." And it's like, that is exactly how it is. Like the door opens, people start trickling through. You're able to kind of stay on top of everything. And then with in like the 30 minute mark where you literally have every table full and everyone's complaining that they're not getting their stuff fast enough. And you're just like trying to cut and serve as quickly as humanly possible. God, like it's not it. fun. That might be why I didn't like the menu as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I hadn't really pieced that together, but the menu rubbed me the wrong way for a couple of reasons. But I think one of them might've been just kind of PTSD kitchen, kitchen from anxiety. The, yeah. yeah, dude. Yeah. All right. It's also well, why anyway. I don't like any of those, oh, any of those like top chef shows, like Megan still watches those. And the only one I can oh. stand is, uh, uh, um, Great British, British, baking, British show. baking Show because it's so low. I don't, I don't want to say low stress because there is like some stress to it, but it's just like everybody's so nice to each other. So I was going to say I, so. I'm I'm all on Great British Baking Show and nailed it. The two least stressful cooking shows <laughs> on television. Because um, yeah. man, none of those nailed it has the same vibe as Great British Baking Show because all of them know that they're equally bad. So there's yes. no yeah. like bitterness <laughs> towards anybody. None. Um, all right, Kyle or Scott, whoever wants to go next. Kyle. Um, just on the, I, I wasn't going to talk about this, but just on the topic of that, as far as like watching a show that you have a toe in because of a thing that you're involved in. I finished the first season of Barry. Obviously, I'm three seasons behind and I'm bad, and I'm bad at TV, but fuck is Barry good. That's all next on my list for the same life. thing. Everyone tells me it's amazing. You, you, Scott, you don't watch it. <laughs> oh, I have no interest. Yeah. In Barry. You especially will love it, uh, Matt. I, I think that it's a really good. It's a really good dark comedy. There are really like dense, dark moments that are brutal, and then there's also like great levity and awkwardness when Bill Hader tries to go to an acting class, and it is just. Uh, I mean, it's it's really fun. Season one's very fun. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, uh, next year I'll tell you how season two is. Um, <laughs> but I think that the one that I really wanted to talk about was I went and I watched hell house LLC. Um, yeah. And, uh, it's the first time I watched it. Uh, I really liked it. It's, like, it I think it's low key. One of, of the fun. best found footage movies that's ever been made. I, I think, uh, yeah, and I think it's great. It's actually for, you know, scary, which is hard to it's say. It's so scary. It was scary. And we were, you know, um, Jeanette had come over. It was her birthday. Uh, so we had spent some time watching. And I don't, it was it was for their birthday. So we watched three movies in one day. And I just don't do that. Oh, no. Uh, so I, took the day I only off, do that when was, I'm at Matt's house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was it was awesome. So our, our we it was, um, it was Scare Me, which I'll talk about another time um hellraiser 3 and yeah. uh which i don't need to talk about any other time and then um and then hell house llc and yeah i mean if anybody hasn't seen it um i know this is going to come out after spooky season but add it to your rotation 
for next October or just like jump into it because I think that um, I don't know. It's really it was really fun. I, I'm excited to see some of the sequels. Uh, I don't know how they'll hold up, but it's the same uh, writer director or at least director. If for a lot, I of watched them. the second um, and I remember liking it, but I don't think it has as much rewatchability. And I, sure. I the third one is are all three of them on Shutter right now? Yes, they're all on Shutter because I just added them to my watch list recently. Yeah, I, I yeah. am going to. My, I'm I am hell bent on watching the third one um, in the next week yeah. or two. Yeah, really fun. Like it felt, it felt East Coast in New England through and through. Yes, like I yeah. just sort of like I, I just I really they they nailed it. They did. They nailed it, and uh, I had a lot of fun watching it. Um, and real quick before we go to Scott, because you gave a shout out to Scare Me. Uh, if anyone wants to learn more about Scare Me, dig real deep into the archives of this podcast where I interviewed the writer, director, and star Josh Rubin about that movie. Josh, uh, cool. he's, he's so, so funny. He's so very, and he also made Werewolves Within, which I thought was a perfectly yep. fun little movie a couple years ago. And, and he's, he's blowing up on TikTok on this improv show that name totally escapes me, but if you are on, like, it'll just come up. Uh, all the time. Is it the game show reasons. one where they just get tossed topics? Yeah, yeah I forget yes. what it's called, but yes. It's, he's fucking hysterical. It's basically like, the same as what so like funny. Bacon and Nate do with Poof the Magical Game Show, where it's just like, hey, here's the thing, improvise it. Um, yeah. All right, yeah. Scott. Uh, I'll take us home with Totally Killer. Uh, Megan and I watched oh. Totally Killer, and um, so I loved it. Megan loved it. It was super fun. Um, it was very, I mean, so, as far as slashers go, solid slasher movie, like kind of brutal in the kills, um, but the script is great. The script is super mm. fun, um, and Kiernan Shipka is an absolutely terrible actor, except in this. She does a great <laughs> job. So, I don't know if she took lessons or if she was just in the hands of somebody that knew how to get her to be funny or what, but it was just such a great mix. The, I thought that the cast was super fun. Um, Megan made a joke. The only downside I think that she saw um, was that she was like, man, the... These aren't these aren't Mad Men level costumes because it's a time travel slasher movie. She goes back in time to try and stop these people. This 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 killer um, that that's killing her mom's friends when when her mom was in high school. So um, it is. I mean, that, so that she goes back to like eighty five or eighty seven or whatever it is, and and um, yeah, that's it's okay. Go, wait, but, she goes back in time. Yeah, yeah. So the the conceit oh, of the movie cool. is that her best friend. Uh, so there's a science fair. So her, yeah. So her her mom survived the this sweet sixteen slasher when she was mm -hmm. sixteen, um, and it is now like um, you know Kieran and Shipka it's turning sixteen, and so her mom's worried that she is going to be attacked by the the killer because sure. she, her mom got a note that said your next one day. And um, so her mom gets killed on Halloween and the killer's coming after Kieran and Chipka's character. She runs to the science fair at this abandoned fairground where her best friend has a um, time machine because she's like going to try and go back in time and save her mom. And the killer, the time machine doesn't work. The killer stabs the time machine's console, and it was like the missing piece. She goes back in time, and she's trying to solve the murders, um, stop them before they happen um, back in, like, 1985. So she's hanging concept. out with her mom as a 16-year-old when she's a 16-year-old. Oh um, but she has to lie and say that she's psychic instead of, you know, a time traveler. Yeah. Um, and It makes just... sense why so many people told me. I haven't seen it yet, but everyone keeps telling me it's, like, the perfect hybrid of Final Girls and Happy Death Day and what you're describing sounds yes. like the perfect yes i got a of lot those of things. happy death day from it um happy death day is definitely it's a different vibe i can't really give you a this definitely has like the, it, it it leans really hard into teen 80s teen comedies without being derivative is great, but it also really has a whole lot of scream to it um more so than final girls in my opinion um okay Cool. Uh, but it's it, it, it's because it is actually the kills are quite brutal because I'm like watching it, I'm like damn this is this fight choreography is crazy and um 
I don't know if it was rated R. I'm guessing it's rated R. Um, but it's real. It's pretty tame. You know, like it's a pretty tame movie. It's fun. It's not intense. There are just a couple scenes that are like, damn, this is really a slasher movie. So yeah, it was highly recommend. One of the better movies I've watched in a long time. All right. Well, you know, Scott took us home with a horror movie, which is not what we watched this week. Um, but stay tuned. <laughs> I had tuned. to try and turn this back into a horror movie night. <laughs> stay, stay tuned next week when we'll actually talk about a horror movie again on Horror Movie Night. What? You're listening to the Geekscape Network. 